been before. Um, I am Matthew Gibb. Uh, Brooks is Deputy Executive for Economic Development. So I think most everybody knows me. I see all kinds of familiar faces. It's okay, you wipe off it. That's good. So welcome. This is Academy Session number four for 2014. We had a little bit of a delay. I guess it's still working. We had a little bit, we had a little bit of a delay in, uh, in this particular session because of uh, some really good things. We had some communities call us and say, you know, Matt, we want to be at the last session. We've had a lot of people there. Um, but we've got a special joint meeting of the Board and Planning Commission. And sorry, this project is more important than you. And I couldn't have been more happy to hear that. Because that means that there is activity out there. So who has projects going on now that they didn't have two years ago? Everybody should be raising their hand. We have projects, right? Who has actually a planning commission meeting every month now, as opposed to 2009 or 10? Right? So a lot of the communities every month. Remember, there's been times in the past few years where communities didn't have planning commission meetings for sometimes six months because there just wasn't any projects. There wasn't anything going on. So everybody's getting busier, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So who has held a free app meeting in the last 30 days in your community? All right. So I see Royal Oak has held a free app. Orion, White Lakes held a pre app. Who else has held a pre app meeting? Troy, Clarkson, everybody. Everybody's holding a pre app, right? Pontiac, is anybody Pontiac been in for Priyat? You know? Not sure, not sure. All right, well, you guys got a ton of stuff going on, so maybe it's just all so good you don't need Priyat. Yeah, it's all so good, Pontiac, great. All right, so who's actually attended a Priyat meeting in the last 30 days? Wow, good. Lots of folks from Troy, Gloria, that's good. So, today is, uh, uh, talking about where we're going. So I look at this poster, and the topic today is uh, management structure. I remember when we started this, we said how important it was that you had buy-in from the idea of being one-stop ready as a community from everybody in your community. You guys remember me hammering that over and over and over and over again? Why did I say that? Why did I say it was important that everybody had to have buy-in? Here's so you can get the customer ready to go. That's better than speed up the process, right? So it's not really necessarily going fast, it's going efficient. Quality, but at a very efficient pace. Everybody has to be involved. Why else would I want everybody involved? Why else would I want everybody involved in this? At least to be knowledgeable about what you're doing. Everybody's on the same page moving forward. Does that mean everybody has to say yes to everything? No, it does not mean that, right? So I look at management structure, we're going to talk about tonight, and I look at the poster. So Auburn Hills, if you all heard me talk about Auburn Hills and their top to bottom integrated structure. Now we wanted to get some folks from Auburn Hills to come and talk about that tonight, but they've got too much stuff on their agenda, so they couldn't. So that's a good sign too, right? Uh, Auburn Hills about, I don't know, four or five weeks ago called me up and said we have eight new construction Greenfield projects on our agenda tonight, all seeking tax abatement. And if you have any objection to any of those, they had eight projects that were being constructed on one agenda. It's pretty good stuff. Top to bottom. But here's something I know. Remember when I said you, you got to sign a poster? So who in the room has signed the poster? Right, I see some hands that have not come up. Right, so look at Auburn Hills, this great community we always brag about. This isn't everybody. Did you think this is their whole management structure? It's not even half the council, right? The people that I know learning from, from Auburn Hills. Tonight when we talk about management structure, the topic is really to have you thinking in your communities about who are the players, who's involved? Who can I get better informed? What is going to be the, the roadblocks or the accelerators in my community amongst the people and the players in my <coughs> talk about management structure? So we talk about management structure. Who are those people? Why do I need to know that? What, why do I care what the inspectors do? What do I care if the planner is, doesn't understand our economic business? Why do I care about those things? That's what tonight is about. It's talking about why it's important for you to care about those things and the impact that it has on driving an economic vision for your community and how it can have substantial negative impact on you, <coughs> even though you're not one of those people. So we say to people, sign a poster for a reason. Doesn't mean have to. But it gets you in the mindset that at some point, yeah, I agreed that we were going to be one-stop ready in this community, and we're going to solve those issues. 
See, I sign a poster. I don't like this project. Matter of fact, I hate this project. I don't care if you hate the project. As long as you say, you know what we're going to do, though? We're going to prove to this person why it doesn't fit for our community in an efficient way to send them away happy instead of send them away angry. You can just say, no, it's like So management structure. So we've talked tonight about a recap. Well, let's do a recap, right? So let's talk about a recap. Everybody remember this slide? Right? We talked about jobs and what we're trying to do here. So we just had our business roundtable yesterday. Kevin Orr spoke um, very eloquently. <coughs> I know Supervisor Barnett and some others were there. Um, and he talked about what's happening in Detroit and some other things. And always in the context of events when we do things in the county where we're talking about where we're at, which is really where our business roundtable is. So we have about 200 members of our business roundtable that give recommendations every year to Brooks and says, if you could just fix this, wouldn't life be grand? We fix about 80% of those uh, uh, over the 22 years of the business roundtable. So it's always nice to reflect where we're at. Now remember what I said when we talked about this slide, that we lost all these jobs and we're getting all these jobs back, but we're still not there yet. 2016, Dan Riley's here, so he'll probably correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. But I believe the unemployment rate in Oakland County is still at about 6.8%. Where's Dan? Riley, where are you? Am I right? 6.8? What's that? Are we at 6.8%? 6.9. <laughs> Come on, brother, you're killing me. You're killing me. <laughs> so, let's see when I said who had a planning commission and who's had a pre apt and that, oh my gosh, we're getting busy again. Um, yeah, we're still at 6.8% unemployment. And we still have a significant way to go to replace not only the whole but where we're going. Remember, we talked about how you can build on your assets. Now, there's a reason we go back through this stuff, folks is because economic development is not only making decisions, it's about having an ingrained sense of who you are and your knowledge base going forward. So remember we talked about assets? We talked about how you define your assets. We had the folks from uh, Hamilton Anderson come in and talk about different ways you can use local resources and different things. Like, you know, the 1950s house is suddenly like the chic modern house now. Those types of things, how you play on off all of that. Having an understanding of where you're at from an economic context. What does this mean to your community? This means 62 jobs that pay this amount, or does this mean that old man Johnson's fence is getting torn up? What is your perspective when you approach economic development? Some of the tools that you could use, implementation tools, having an understanding of all of the tools. That's interesting, my good friend Chris Barnett, as he was in, he was talking to Dave Schreiber, saying, every time I come to one of the economic development meetings, I learn about more awesome tools that not only the county has, but the state might have, or my neighbor might have, how do we learn more about that stuff? This is why 100 of you came on the Christmas holiday season here um, after Thanksgiving to remind yourself that they're out there. So do you know the tools? Remember we talked about these things. You as a planning commissioner, you as a planner, as an economic development, as a council person, do you even know the tools? If you're standing in a restaurant or the bar or the coffee shop and somebody says, man, I can't get, I can't get this last piece of financing, do you know the tools? If you have it at hand, if you don't have it at hand, you know who to call. Remember, we talked about these things. The more you think about, oh, shoot, I don't know what the heck this guy's talking about, the better it is for me. Because that means that you care. And you want to learn some more about what the tools are. And remember, we talked about your role in the process. My favorite slide I ever found from Expansion Solution Magazine. Remember, we talked about all the things that go into them making a decision. Now, this doesn't always happen, right? Some fly-by-nights come in and they just drop something on your table. But for substantial projects, so like in uh, Pontiac, the Challenge Manufacturing Facility. So Challenge Manufacturing is building a 600,000 square foot facility. And how many employees are it going to be? About 500. 500 employees. So everybody would want something like that in their community if they could have a right spot for it, right? You'd want 600,000 square foot of tax space. You'd want all those employees. For them to locate that plant, they have to go through all of these types of analysis. Remember we talked about, sometimes it finally gets to your doorstep when you're 18 months into a process. Mm -hmm. And if you decide you're going to take 18 <coughs> months to decide about old man Johnson's fits, remember we talked about your role? Your role is this tiny little box that's all covered up with this other stuff. <laughs> and we always have to be mindful of that, particularly on the government side, of how do we become advocates for our community and at the same time understanding what our role is in the process of locating investment in our community. We had a panel discussion, Matt Farrell and C. Bob. Who remembers that discussion? What's the one thing you remember from that discussion? 
You had to raise your hand. You know, this is going to be a night we pick on you. Gary Wong got sick. I would pick on you. Um, so. I do remember that they used to say, no, make it fast. You're going to say, no, make it fast, right? Yeah. All right, who else remembers something from when we had these two developers <coughs> come in? That was a CBS guy, right? Yeah. The CBS guy. Yeah. 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 CBS guy yeah. selling cigarettes at Rack over first. Yeah. That. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's good. Made a whole difference in their business model. Who else remembered something that these two said? I mean, I had to remember something. What else did we remember? Loose lips sink ships. Yeah, loose yeah. lips sink ships. Talking about projects, getting the getting the discussion going, right? If you're out there and, and moving along. Who else remembers? This, this is valuable stuff, right? Anything? Anything? <coughs> yeah, they said there's certain communities they don't like, right? Why do you think they said that? Why do you think they said that? Did they I put them up to it? Or do you think it's true that there's communities they don't like to work with? Time is money. Who remembers some of the things they said of why they didn't like to work there? There's one word we're going to drive at tonight that, that, that I'm hoping that you remember. Communication. Remember? Remember when they said that if your planner keeps writing review letters and you don't know he keeps writing review letters or she keeps writing review letters and it's not your expectation that that continues to happen. Why is that continuing to happen? Remember they said the worst thing that can happen is four and five reviews of something that should just get handled up front. Everybody remember that? Yeah. Right? That was most important to these. It wasn't that they want, didn't want a review letter and want 30 conditions. They'll take the 30 conditions, just do the whole darn thing at once or maybe twice. Remember? They said it's when you get into that third and fourth and fifth review and I'm writing checks all the time, and my timeline delayed because you forgot that your role is only here, and I'm on my fifth review letter, and it's just not getting right. Now they acknowledge, sometimes it's the developers, it's not getting, we got a project in Novi that we finally called the bluff on a very good friend of mine that kept saying that Novi was the problem. Well, we finally called the bluff, it's not Novi. The developer just does not want to do what they have to do on that particular development on a couple issues, so it's at a stalemate. Well, you get to that sometimes, right? Developer stalemate. But what they were saying was communication. <clears throat> so how do you solve communication? As you're thinking about some of the things that we're doing. Um, Caroline Workman came in and started to talk about implementation of best practices. This was our most recent just a couple months ago. About the importance of having these steps. Pre-application project, you know, from the internet, business community input. So if the developers are saying, Please just tell us everything up front and, and what did you say again? <coughs> say no fast. Say no fast. Say no fast. Whatever they said that. Just if you don't want us, just tell us. Yeah. If you need 30 things changed out of plan, just tell us. Basically what you're saying. So when you get to this process, free application project tracking, <coughs> somebody in your system, in your management structure, touches every aspect of this process, right? Somewhere they do. You know, if we say internet access, Don, Don Warmer said internet, internet access, Dick Carly did, sorry, Dick Carly did, internet access, that touches your clerk's department, right? Your building clerks, all of that. Access to information, permitting, that not only touches what gets approved, but that touches the guys out in the field that are inspecting things, the guys that are issuing the permits and reviewing the plans. Project tracking, that goes to the Randys of the world and some of the others, and the, and the, and the clerks in the building department and the software systems that you have. Pre-application really touches everybody, right? So somebody in your management structure is, affects all of these things. And these are the what we believe are the most key important things because in communities around the country that do these all of these five things really, really well. I remember when I opened the program, I said, I said we originally had a list of like 28 things. And they said nobody will show up at the meeting. So at least like 100 of you didn't get scared off, right? Um, because we, we, we really focus it down. So the communities around the country, and even here in Oakland County, that do this stuff really well, are the ones that are doing better than others. They've got more positive development, they've got cool projects, they've got all of that, because these people say, these communities are the ones that I want to go to. When they say, there's communities I don't really feel like doing with. Somewhere along this process in the management structure, something screws up all the time. And that's why they don't want to be there. It might be in this area in permitting, it might be that they don't get information. It might be something else. This is tonight's, tonight's uh, topic, right? So perceptions. So before we get into this, I want to get all of you talking. So what we're going to do today, one, I have to pick on Gary Wall. Do you have a picture of Gary Wall in here, Brian? 
He was supposed to be here. Oh, he just have his name. All right, so Gary went hunting in Iowa for pheasant, and now he's too sick to respect all of you and come and give you a present. Oh. <laughs> so when you see Gary Wall, the great advisor of Waterford Township, but I think there's some other Waterford folks here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tony, too. He skipped, too, because Gary's not here. I'm kidding. Um, you give Gary Wall all kinds of, you know what, um, that, that he, he blew you up. He didn't know this. He really said, well, before we talk to you, so tonight you guys are giving the presentation. So okay. lucky you. All right? So in the context of everything I'm talking about, let's talk first about management structure as it applies in the overall context of a project coming into your community. <coughs> so, in your community, let's pick, uh, um, wait, all right. Who's at the top of the management structure in your community? Supervisors. Supervisors at the top of, of the management structure. Um, how does your township board feel about that? You okay with that? No. Okay, so is there a community that is either a city or a township that that would have a different idea of what would be the top of the management structure in your community. So are you different or a supervisor, you're the top of the management structure? Right. All right. So are you saying that from a legal sense or from that's something that your community's decided? Right. Does your community say the top of our management structure is <coughs> Greg, he's, he's the man. <laughs> or are you saying it because the supervisor is the legal top of the food chain? <coughs> is, there, is there a difference? Is there a difference to what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. What so much of a difference? Who thinks there's a difference in what I'm saying? As to whether you're the legal top of the food chain or whether your community said you're the top of the food chain. There's a little bit of a difference, isn't it? What if he's full of beans and doesn't know what the hell he's doing? Maybe he's the weak link. Could be. Neil, what do you think? When I say who's the top of a management structure from an economic development perspective, where, where does the top of that rest? Is it with Chris? Yes. With Chris? What if he does something you don't like? That's okay? <coughs> the board, board all agrees with him. <coughs> so what if Chris, what if Chris comes in one day and says, I'm the top of the structure. My vision is, is that, is that Orient Township, that um, the only development we allow now is 800 square foot condo units and strip malls. And that's all Orient Township would ever be because that's my vision as a top of the food chain. I only say that because I live there. I can't imagine you would do that. So <laughs> I'm not both you. <coughs> the point I'm trying to make is, is having an understanding of the top of the management structure is very important. Who do the permit officers in White Lake Township think is the top of the food chain in White Lake? Permit officers? Yeah, the people that do your inspections. So those building managers at the top of the food chain for the permit guys, but you're not. So the permit guys think the top of the food chain is the building official, but not the supervisor. But you're the top of the food chain for the township. Does that make sense to you? Does that make sense? Does that make sense to everybody? No. 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 Why is it? Who said no? Why does it not make sense? You're like, Gary Wall. <laughs> <laughs> At least she came. You know? All right, somebody else had said no. Why does that not make sense to you? Supervisor, why does it not make sense? We need one person at the top. One person at the top. Somebody that uh, everybody can answer with. Can somebody the lead, leads the top, the top of the food chain. Let me try. Can I try? Yeah, Chris. You no, know, I'd say that um, legally, yes. But the way I think that we operate is, is that we have we, we rely on our planner, who has been with us for a while, who understands the character of our community. His input is very important. Our building department. So I think when we're in these pre-application meetings, it's not just what I say. We bounce ideas and kind of come to a collective. And ultimately, normally, the planning commission and the board will agree with kind of what our group recommends. So when you get into the process, it becomes more of a group vision. Right. Even though you have got some dissension and some you know, ups and downs, you come to a consensus and that's the group vision that leads forward. Right, for the planning process. So it starts to break down as a distinction then. So Greg's the chief legal officer, you're the chief legal officer. But when it gets into more of a visionary process, it does become more of a collective. Is that what you're saying? I, that's the way I feel. Yeah. Yeah. Troy, you guys are being silent. Mark, 
What's the top of the management structure in Troy when it comes to economic development? City manager. City manager is the top of the, top of the management structure? Yes. Now, why do you say that so affirmatively? Does Troy's kicking ass right now? And you, no, you it's a, they're or is that very the strong in the city management form of government. I mean, we have our fire chief here who's worked for the city for over 30 years. It's always been that way, right, Bill? He doesn't say it very loud, he just said yes. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're actually closest to the mic, so you're on camera. So <laughs> but Matt, these, Matt, so wanna, I want to say something. I'm on okay. the West Bloomfield uh, Planning Commission, mm -hmm. and there are things, there are times when governments are dysfunctional. And I'm on the Planning Commission for a community that's dysfunctional. Yeah. You know, where like one of the elected officials has a coalition and can overpower the supervisor because they can get the votes. And so there's no leadership. So it breaks down, the whole leadership scale breaks down. And things take forever to get approved at the Planning Commission and Township Board. See, there must be a Red Wings game or something at seven. You're trying to expedite this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, perfect. No, I need your help because I'm on the Planning Commission. Yeah. <laughs> Mark, who is doing phenomenal work in Troy, brings up the point of the dialogue, which is why I'm being a little obtuse and why there's a, a question mark here. So Auburn Hills and their structure, and I'm just going to use Auburn Hills, don't think that I'm in love with them or anything, it's just they have a good structure of what their understanding is of their structure. <coughs> so Auburn Hills says the top of the food chain is the city council, guided by the city manager. The reason they say that is because of the points that Mark made, is they determine how to be a functional government and a functional process and not a dysfunctional role playing and favorite playing process. They rely heavily on their downstream people. Now, you guys have heard me use that term before in these sessions, right? The downstream is very important. If the downstream people, which are maybe more important than the management people, whether it's city manager or council, if the downstream people don't have a fundamental understanding of what the vision is from the top of the structure, you turn into what Mark's described. Because then you have coalitions not only of outside forces, but you have staff forces that will do things that they just darn well pleased to do themselves. And they could care less about what the vision is of your community. This is really at the heart of what we're talking about in management structure. Now, I know we put up some questions here. We've got some more questions. You know, you want to be in when and the pre-op and the inform the board. This is, <coughs> this is the process. But because, you know, Gary was supposed to come and we had a different thing. I told Brett and the other guys, I said, I'm just going to go right to the heart of the issue tonight. The heart of the issue is to do this work from communities that, that really kick tail in economic development. Now, I'm not talking about I proved a project. I'm talking about you have a fundamental top to bottom understanding of this is where our community is going. This is why this fast food joint's going on the corner even though it pisses off the neighbor. Is you have a fundamental understanding top to bottom of where you're going. This is why we're giving the tax abatement to challenge manufacturing because it does this. This is why it's going in this area. When they walked into Auburn Hills, first introduced this program, they said we don't need it, but they understood that they could learn and we could learn from them. Other communities are the same way. A council person said, said when asked, I said, well, how do you know this is important? He said, because I trust every piece of information I'm getting has been vetted in the best interest of our community based upon the direction that our city council, our mayor, and our city manager is giving. So who can say that about their community in complete honesty? That everybody in their system acts in the best faith of the direction of their community based upon the vision and the direction and the commitment that their council or board is extending. Troy, you guys are close. Heck, a lot better than five years ago. So it's, oh, yeah. yeah. It's good. It's good. It's a hard question, isn't it? I mean, it's a hard question. It's, um, when I was supervisor in Oregon Township, um, uh, and some people have heard me give this, this recollection, um, and some people were involved. Neil was there, he was on the board with me, and, and, and some others. <coughs> We got to a point where it became so frustrating that we were so disjointed. Not as bad as what you're talking about, Mark. That is, they want to join the program, by the way. That might help, so it's good. Um, we were just disjointed. We had 
people on the zoning board that were doing things that were contrary to direction that we were trying to take the community. Um, it was 09, so you know the GM story, all that stuff was there, but we had these people that were good, well intentioned, but they were gonna, it's gonna be their point of view and the hell with everybody else. And they were causing <coughs> people to have that negative perception even worse than I would have ever imagined. Developers calling me and saying, oh my God, your community is worse than seven day. All because of the mannerism that our management structure was off on these tangents. And the planning commission, that was, everybody was well intentioned, good people. I'm not saying it was bad people. It was just people kind of leading their own agendas. They were doing what they wanted to do. The township board was kind of there and kind of not there. And, <coughs> You know, we're, we're going to get through it all. And finally, we called everybody together. We called the Planning Commission. We called our consultants together. We called the attorney. We had the board, the Planning Commission, the ZBA. We had everybody there. Remember, Neil? We had that big meeting, that big follow meeting. And I kind of lost it. So I'm not encouraging you to lose it <laughs> if you're encountering these things. But, but I kind of lost it. And that was the night I said that, that it, you have to stop collectively being a can't or a won't. If in your community you have people that are bouncing to their own drum, it's okay as long as they're in the structure saying, we are going this way, I just don't like this one, or I'm dissenting on this one because. That's, that's unbelievable great American republic democracy. If you've got somebody that says, I'm not gonna show up in the hell with you and I'm just gonna go off to a different drum, you've got a problem. They're a can't or a won't, they, I, I can't do this or I won't do this. And if you have people that say, I can't do this or I won't do this in your community, there's your problem. So where in the management structure do you find those people? <coughs> and do you find them at the pre act meeting? So who's in a pre act meeting? Let's go, let's go through that. <coughs> so in Highland, who's in a pre act meeting? Right. Zoning So you've got three or four key people. Troy, who do you pull into your pre-op meetings when you got a project coming? For a Greenfield project, it would be the planning director, the economic development specialist, uh, representative of the building department, a representative of the engineering department. Fire. Uh, fire and a representative of the fire department, fire at department. the very least. So you, you bring in those career. core functions. Absolutely. Why do you bring them in? What's the point? To get everyone, to get Everyone an opportunity to get their input, communicate, let everyone know what's coming down, what's coming down the line. Uh, make sure we're on the same page. We can inform the applicant of any red flags, any potential uh, stumbling blocks or issues early on in the process, so it doesn't become an issue later on in the process. So the more structure you have at the at the beginning, the better. Right? Yes. Yeah. Is it you able to identify when somebody's going rogue on you? Then, I mean, it, 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 I'm assuming in the meeting there's. There's dialogue, there's input, and then, if, and then if after the meeting somebody goes and they do 180 degrees different than what was the dialogue of the meeting, they probably <laughs> stand out, right? Oh, yeah. Well, that, that's one of the one of the reasons you do that is so that they, they don't go rogue. Everyone's on the same page, and you get that up front early on. Right. So, for communities, if we're talking about our first question, which my staff for some reason changed it from um, when do you need to open to yeah. who you want to be and when, came up with that. Where's Raz again? He's screwed up. That sounds It's the same thing though, right? When you want to open. That's the fundamental question, because you set your timeline backwards then. I gotta be open by April first, so figure out how to get you there. You want me? So the structure of having a management structure that starts with the core people involved in the at the table is important, right? So who else has a structure like that? I think Orion does. You guys have a structure like that, right? You bring in everybody, you bring in your consultants. Um, you guys have a similar <coughs> structure. Right? So who's at your pre act meeting? Planners, uh, building director, fire department, planning commission. We've had uh, three or four of them the last few months, and that was supervisor. Supervisor comes as well. Yeah, you bring in any of your um, your uh, uh, consultants? You probably just said a planner. Planner? Okay. Yeah, engineer? Yeah, like that? Well, when needed? We've had that. We've had the uh, overall the clerk there. Okay. Time, so. When it's needed. So, in your management structure, right from the get go, you know, I'm talking about pre app meetings. How do you assure that 
All those people know what's going on if you're a, a board member. Who's the township board member? How do you know what they're saying about me? Do I have a clue? Do you care? Very yeah, much so. Do you just trust that it's all going the way you want it to go? Okay, well, so a couple come in. The, the expectation would be? I hope they go right. That, that's what it sounds like. Has there been a dialogue, supervisor, a dialogue about this is how we want to run these and this is how we'll keep people in included and informed? Our staff is too. So you guys are being too quiet back here. So who who's who attends the pre-app meetings when you have pre-app meetings? At White Lake, the same group as Troy basically. It depends on the project. You know, as we all know, some projects tend to be more confidential by request than others. So we usually try to lay out all the options on the phone with them. You know, depending on whether or not utilities are already on site or not, we may be more or less involved in front of utilities and engineers. Development obviously um, takes on a, maybe a, a different tone as well, but usually leave it to them, and we we make suggestions, but we don't really push. We want to get them in the ballpark, we want them to feel comfortable. We're very quick about turning around, so uh, you know, that usually helps things along. But it's basically the same cast of characters. So, Brent, do you attend the meetings? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> How do they go? Who, who, who leads the charge in these meetings? It depends on the project most of the time. Um, usually, the township. By the time we get to the meetings that I'm in, the township board's already approved the overall site plan, mm -hmm. and then it's turned over to staff to make sure the ordinances and the compliance with the plan put together and just move on. So there's an expectation that once it gets to your level, that the, the prior step has been handled. There's a good understanding that that process has gone through and it gets to you and now you're you're processing it out from there. <coughs> uh, do you ever do you ever stop and question and say what in the heck are they doing here? Well I'm usually involved right from the okay. get-go so, so you're I've never had that answer. question. Okay. Well. <laughs> All right good so who from White Lake doesn't attend these meetings? There's got to be somebody here that doesn't. So what's your expectation to happen with all this stuff? Well so you're still part of the system. <coughs> she's the assessor for those. Hard to hear across the board. Yeah, she's the assessor. Um, sorry, we're doing a dialogue. <coughs> and should be passing. Here, you're the first one who gets to use the mic. <laughs> <laughs> assessors are always the most outgoing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> system, right? yeah. So, so the. So you're part of you're part of Greg's team. You're the assessor, right? You have the, the valuable function clearly in the township. So. You have a vested interest in all this. You wouldn't be here if you didn't think you had a vested interest, right? Right. So as they go through this process, where Brent's involved, and Greg's, you know, he's the big booba in charge, as he proclaimed earlier. Uh, what's the expectation that they're they're just super smart? They know what they're doing. How do you have the? Well, I do have the confidence in the staff that I work with. Okay. They know what they're doing and what they're doing so properly. Um, I'm going to involve things that's necessary for me to be involved in the pre is not so your expectation though, though is that they're they're kind of handling the shop and they're they're into things right yes. yeah well it's good because they're building faith how about with you guys who doesn't attend pre-op meetings all of you do right from the planning commission yeah the point i'm driving at is if you're sitting on council or board level, 
do you have confidence that what's being said in that meeting is adhering to the vision of where you're trying to drive your community? Now, I'm not saying that means you just leave it to them. I'm saying, do you have confidence that they're representing <coughs> the community? And if you do, how do you get that confidence? It's important to understand this. When you go to this bottom line, streamline the process and empower staff. This is a critical component. Because if you're a board member and a council person and you don't have complete trust that, that the planner and the engineer are acting in an efficient way, in a timely way, Supervisor, you're saying we want to mold our culture so that, that the whole public says, wow, they're, they're ready, they're responsive, they're answering our questions, they're getting us done. Those knucklehead developers that come to these sessions, they're not going to come in and say, we got eight reviews. Not going to say it about our community. To build the trust and the confidence, you have to start building it from the top, having an understanding of, okay, we're on the same page. We don't vote there all the time. We can have four or three votes, that's fine. We can have one to six, we can have whatever kind of votes, doesn't matter. Because we're all on the same page saying, this is in the best interest of our community to decide this. Not who wins or loses on the project. So once you get that going and you have that idea, and then your pre-op meetings, as Troy has said, you bring in critical players and there's an expectation that they're participating <clears throat> in the dialogue of those meetings. So you've got management on top that's setting a vision, which is your elected officials. Sorry, the elected officials are the ones that pound the pavement they're the ones that got to sit at the big boy and get yelled at when they do something that's contrary to everybody else. It's not easy being elected official. They're there for a reason. Your, your electrical inspector is not the one that sets the vision for your community. They just don't. Sorry if there's electrical inspections here. They can participate. They can give advice. They can say, we really need to do this. But ultimately, the top of it is the people that are setting the structure. Your pre-op meeting gets all of your critical components. So when it goes south, you know where it came from. You all remember me telling the story about Jeff Key, my really good friend was our fire marshal, fire chief for the longest time in Oregon. Jeff would not participate. And so finally I threatened to fire him. I don't know if I could have, he would have never let me. But, but <laughs> it got to that point. Because if your management structure is such that we are going to be a ready and responsive community to, to challenge any opportunity that comes our way, even if we say no, say no fast, right? If you don't want it, say no fast. That's the best, the best policy. You still have people in your structure that might not participate. How do you fish them out? How do you empower them? So now we're going to have really a, 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 a good discussion on empowering staff. So this is, this is a good one. I'll just hand this around for, for answers. All right, so let me pick on somebody here. I can't pick on you guys. You do work. Um, okay, Pontiac. This is the toughest one because of your structure right now. All right, so who's your principal um, inspector for building permits? Who does that work? Do you know him personally? Sam, you don't know him personally? All right, so for Highland, that's you, you know him. You signed the paychecks. <laughs> Somebody that's not him. Who, who can name the principal person that does your inspections in your community when somebody gets a building permit? You know who? Steve Davies. All right. So, so you're all from the same community. Do you all agree that that's the person? Oh, now all you know, right? Oh, yeah, that's him. That's him. I knew it. I knew it. I knew, it. I knew he was out there. So, from Independence. Who's, who's, who's the, the doing all the inspections? I know you're not dragging your butt out there to do it. We have a building director. He does some, but we have two contract inspectors. You know him by name? Yeah. But you could recognize him in a, in, in a mug shot. You could recognize him? <laughs> yeah? That's good. You guys know who it is? In your community? You're going to have to amplify. Ah, yeah, yeah. So why am I asking this? Mike Flood, why am I asking this? Why am I asking, do you know who your building inspector is? That's a good question. <coughs> it is a good question. Neil, why am I asking who your building inspector is? We've got a coordinator. We've got a coordinator with it, right? Is it important? Tim McNaught, is it important 
that <coughs> management have an understanding of what you do on a daily basis? Yes. Yeah, it's important, right? So, empowering staff. By show of hands, that is um, anything in rank above the building inspector. Sorry, building inspectors, you actually control most of the process. So I didn't mean it in a demeaning way. <laughs> but in a structural way, above the rank, who completely 100% trust their building inspector to make decisions in the field on behalf of the township or city that you represent? Got a few hands going up. A lot of hands are not going up. No. All right, so of the hand that didn't come up, Sam, of the hand that didn't come up, why? <coughs> What if you don't know them and they had a past bad reputation? Past bad reputation, yeah. you don't know. All right, who else that didn't raise their hand and said, well, I'm not sure if I'm going to trust some guy to go out in the field and make a decision for my community. Who else didn't raise, you didn't raise your hand? Why? Oh, <laughs> did you raise your hand? I did not, but I also not Oh, geez. All these, all, all these, uh, somebody else that didn't raise their hand that said, I'm just not sure if I would trust that. No brave souls? No brave souls? <clears throat> so what what does it mean to empower staff then? I mean why why would we put it up there? Um, why would we say empower staff then? Trust them. They're doing their job, right? Now you trust all your inspectors. They can speak on your behalf. City manager, rock and roll city, royal oak. They can speak on your behalf. Chris, what do you think? Because you can do everything right, and one person can throw everything off if you're not like-minded. It doesn't mean they have to agree with you, but understanding what we're talking about in this vision, you need the whole team. That's why it's nice that Tim's here. <laughs> That's good. I, I remember one time, I'll tell a quick story, Tim. I remember one time that, 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 that Tim um, uh, was standing at the counter and there was a guy there with a bunch of plans and and he was asking tim when can i when can i um when can i have a submit or get this but he was phrasing it in a way as like well when when is this going to get done give me a time and i was kind of walking and i'm like well i don't know what tim's going to say on this one but you know is these three three plans and tim said thursday it was a tuesday he said thursday and so the guy was saying no I, I don't want to say when I can submit the plans. I want to know when I can, when we can get this done. And Tim said Thursday. And the guy, he was confused. This is a well-heeled guy. He was confused. And Tim finally says, "Don't know. Listen, if you give them to me right now on Tuesday, I will return them on Thursday to you, and you can get your permit and get on with the project." The guy about fell over. On, I about fell over on the floor. <laughs> is that's the kind of proactive <coughs> empowerment that we're talking about? Someone at that level that doesn't have to wait and say, no, no, you know what you need to do? You need to submit them, and there's a form for that, and make sure you have your check-in, and then I'm going to go back and sit at my desk because it's not my job to even talk to you at the counter. It really isn't. I'm not here to solve your problems. I'm here just to review your plans. And so submit them, talk to so-and-so down at the end of the counter, and leave me alone. If you empower your people, and you empower your staff, and you trust them to say those types of things, the staff also gets engaged in, this is fun, reviewing plans all day <clears throat> and not interacting and not having any reward of getting something done creates procrastination. Not that all of you procrastinate to do that work, but it just does. The energy of completing something to have one of these curmudgeon developers fall on the floor with shock is empowering to the person. So if you have an integrated structure where your management on top is marching in a direction. They're giving a direction that says there's certain expectations we have, which we're going to talk about that next, certain expectations we have, that gets all the way down to the lowest level staff to touch the process, and then you empower them to make decisions. Now you're cooking. In Auburn Hills, they have an expectation that their inspection staff, when they go out and they find something in violation, it's expected that they don't just write a ticket. In most communities, if you find a violation, you write a ticket. And then the ticket either goes to court or they try to come in, and now you spend three weeks trying to figure out why you wrote the ticket, and meanwhile the inspector is writing another ticket. In Auburn Hills, they say, hold on a second, you are empowered to make decisions on the spot on behalf of our community. 
So if you find something that's in violation, you are empowered to offer a solution to that person. So does that happen in all, whose community does that happen in with every inspector that you have? If it does, God love you, because that's a very rare thing to have happen. It is very rare. Where inspectors become advocates of the community because they're empowered to do so. As a matter of fact, expected to do so. So when you look at it from a management structure from the bottom up, that's what we're talking about. So let me ask you a couple other questions. So when a project comes to you for approval, if you're a planning commissioner or a board member, what do you expect has been done before it got to you? Who has an answer to the question? Walker, you're sitting there like you're half asleep. <laughs> So before it gets to the ZBA, Don. I'm meditating <coughs> every word. <laughs> before it gets to you, what do you think has been done? What, what happens before it gets to you at the zoning board level? There, there's been a pre act meeting where all of the, the consultants and the people involved in the meeting have all right. they've approved it. So there's been a pre act meeting? So right. you know it's been through that process? Yep. Right. What else has happened before it gets to you? And uh, all of the documentation has been presented, any blueprints, drawings? All, okay. All, all get presented to, to the planning commission. So the next step is, is so they had the pre app where they came in presumably conceptually, said, hey, this is kind of what I want to do. They got some good dialogue on it. They fixed up their plans. They submitted their plans. Yes. All right. So after they submit their plans, then what happens? It goes in front of the planning commission for approval. Okay. So they get the plans and it goes to the planning commission. Is he missing a step? Consultants. So it has to be reviewed first, right? Well, I, I assume the consultants were at the pre-app meeting. Okay. So, so pre-app, which is a tacit review, it gets submitted, and then somebody looks at it again. So now we're three steps into the process. So once somebody looks at it, reviews it, then it gets scheduled for a planning commission meeting, in general sense. So step number four is a planning commission meeting. The planning commission identifies that there's a variance, because you're on the zoning board, right? So the planning commission decides their variance, and then it goes to your board. Step number five. You, you missed a step, or some. Oh, we we okay. miss. We miss a step. Okay. We get the application. We circulate it internally for everyone's comment. So, when we meet, when we have the pre-application meeting, we're typically dealing with a conceptual drawing or an idea. So it's not a full-blown site plan. When the application is submitted, we, we circulate that internally, and that's that's a detailed drawing where all the departments who participated in the pre-application plus other departments have an opportunity to review and comment on the application. Plus they have a deadline when to get it back to the planning department so you're, you can do it in 30 days, the whole process. Right. So you put it on a time schedule. Let's say when they walk in the door, these things happen. Application comes in, you ask for comments back, reviews are done by your professionals. Yes. Um, and then it gets scheduled as a meeting process. All that happens. By ordinance, if you submit 30 days before the meeting, Brent's obligated to get it to the Planning Commission. Everything has to get to the Planning Commission within that 30 day time frame. And the, the site plan is, is communicated, is circulated electronically so we can process <coughs> back electronically, which makes it, we, it gives us an opportunity to quickly process those, those comments and, and, and include them in the report. So, for Don's example, I don't know if think about that. Don and I served on a zoning board appeal for too many years to count, right? I think I'm Tony next door. So in Don's example, I think I'm Mary Payne. Well, no, Mary's a, she's the she's this darling sweetheart of me. So in Don's example, in a township base where they've got outside consultants, this is a process, right? Probably the same in Highland and White Lake and some of the others, right? Things come in, you try to meet with them. There's a review process, and it gets to a board level. So it goes through your process. It gets to the planning commission or Don, and your chance it gets to the to the to the zoning board of appeals. What's the expectation? So in Troy, what's the ex is there a planning commissioner here? I think there is. Right here. There's two of them. Yeah. Three of them. So what's the <coughs> expectation when it gets to you? Oh, yeah, it, it, three it, it better be in order as far as our ordinances. Yeah. And then we look at it for does it really fit the community's vision? Our, we're more vision people. Okay. That's our job. And what we end up doing is saying, well, this could be changed this way. Why didn't you think of turning the building this way? And it would, you know have a better curb appeal or something like that. We give those kind of suggestions. More of a vision, I think, because we depend on staff to follow everything as far as engineering, fire, mm -hmm. roads, all those things. 
So that brings up a good question. Don, I'll get back to you in a minute. So it brings up a good question. So planning commission that says maybe you changed the layout, <clears throat> maybe you changed some of the design characteristics because in their vision it flows a little better. These two have been on planning commission a long time. Is that stuff that's considered in your pre-app? Do you get into the discussion of, well, wait a minute now, when you get to the planning commission, you better move the building this way because the, I, I know what the commissioners are going to say. Do you get into that detail in your pre -app? Yes, we do. All right. So, And why do you do that? I know it's a leading question, but why do you do that? Because we, I've worked with these gentlemen a long time, and I know I know each each planning commissioner brings something to the table. Some of them have their, their quirks <laughs> or their sticking points or what have you, and I know that you're going to want to turn the building because the last three times that we had a similar application, <coughs> there was pushback. So, you, so based on our experience, you may want to do this. So... Why do you think in Troy they can get away with that? So probably, folks, why can you get away with that? I mean, who the hell is he, right? You know, <laughs> he was trained in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> but he just, he just said it, right? He just said it. I can make those comments in my pre app meeting even though I'm not the top official. I'm not the guy that gets sued if we get sued. I'm just the guy that... <clears throat> does the work and makes the recommendations make the system run fast and I can do that because I've worked with them a long time I know what they're going to say I have an understanding that this is going to have to change and shift so let's just get it done now right why would why am I going to send you to the planning commission if I know they're going to do this that builds into this right management structure if you have an understanding top to bottom not of how people are going to vote or if you can twist their arm but if you have an understanding of the basics of this that says, okay, listen, when it gets in here, we need to change it right up front because I know the Planning Commission is going to hate this. And here's why they're going to hate it. If you have that fundamental understanding, how much faster is it going? Ten times faster? It's immeasurable, right? Because you have an understanding of the process of how it, how it comes in. In communities where you don't have, and it's all disjointed, and things come in the door and they get the app, and it's the old routine up here. We have an application and you submit, and then we'll get back to you. And you don't have that understanding top to bottom of we're driving in this direction. I'm going to give you the insider baseball scoop on what you're trying to do here is not going to work because of these three things. So let's reschedule this for next week and we go fix that. Communities that don't do those things because they either don't like each other or they don't trust each other or they just want to be a pain in the ass, whatever it is. I'm doing pretty good. I'm only saying ass. You got to give me credit. Okay. <laughs> you got to give me credit. So <laughs> Do you think that um, that the community would be willing to get in the room to attack the question? Very willing. Yeah, it seems like it is. Very willing. Different yes. than a few years ago, right? Right. Yes. And it seems like the mindset now is, is yeah, we're going to get it all in the room. So how'd you pull it off, Troy? Is this just over years of effort? Is I can assure you when I was practicing law, it wasn't five years ago. It was to eight years ago. It wasn't like this. You guys are doing it different these days. So. So how'd you do it to help Pontiac out? How'd you pull this off? What's the magic sauce? I don't know that there's one magic sauce, but I do know one thing that's happened in our town that's the soft side of the business is we're trusting one another again. Um, we had factions. We had subversive behavior. Oh, wait, this is important. They want to hear. <laughs> Say that whole first part again. It's too good. <laughs> uh, you said something about trust. Do you remember? You know, this is the soft side of, of the business of government and doing government well. It involves everybody, and you have to trust one another. In Troy, we had a period of time where there was mistrust. Some of it willfully manufactured, some of it legitimate. We've moved through that. We are intentionally 
looking at how we work together, find common ground, recognizing our staff is outstanding, and that is the basis of the trust. When people come to recognize their city manager, um, all of these people sitting here have our back as elected officials. It makes us want to have their backs. And now you're starting to work together. We don't always agree on everything, but we disagree now without being disagreeable. The factions in the community, our residents who play into our ab ability to be efficient, are taking a deep breath, and I think faith is being restored in what was already an amazing staff and an amazing structure, the glue dried up on the trust. And um, it's relationship building. It is doing coffee together. It's talking about um, talking with one another. And it, I sound like I'm Pollyanna naive, <laughs> but <coughs> We had all the other hardcore pieces that are the hard side of the business in place, and what was missing was trust, and the relationships had fractured. They are rebuilt, and you know what? The business of government is so much more fun now. Um, uh, we have are a we staff. <laughs> <laughs> we want to do government well. We have a shared vision. Um, if we are empowering. Are we perfect? No. Is any entity perfect? No. But we keep working through. And I, I think that's what we're seeing happen in Detroit and, and, and whatnot, where people, the relationships, the state level here at the county, we, when we can trust one another, we can work well together. So let me ask my friends from Pilot. Because luckily for you, this is session number four, which means you don't have to hear me talk unless you want to come back in the future. So you can choose to not come back, but you it should be fine. But the point I'm making is, is I talk less after this in your lives, except for <clears throat> now behind the scenes, the work that we do going forward. If staff that's our liaisons to your communities, we're going to be working with your community. Part of what we want to do in the next step for all of you, what we've done with our first seven communities, is to empower communities to be helping each other. So Pontiac folks, what if the Troy folks, I could convince them, pizza and a beer or something, I could convince two or three or four of them to come to a forum in Pontiac and say exactly what she just said. Is that something that would even resonate in Pontiac? Is that something that people would be interested in to say, and they would say, well, who's Troy? we got to solve our own business. What's your reaction? Well, for one, actually, I would definitely appreciate that, but I think our, our situation is not as simplistic as it may be. Um, right now, we have a cab board. This is a tran transitional advisory board. Technically, it's, it's just an emergency manager that's been placed to, you know, the names change, but it's still the same kind of concept. So you have a tab board that's distrusted the city council and a city council that distrusts the, the tab board. So I, I don't see no vision right now when it comes to what direction the city is actually going to take. That's sad. Um, currently, I believe the tab board is actually about to sue the city council. So. See, and you guys, you thought you all had it back. <laughs> Well, unless, you know, <clears throat> because you, you're living it, it, this comes off the shout, but I would say <laughs> it's the perfect time for you to have vision. It's the perfect time for your community to have vision, to give the, the, the overriding financial decisions to the tap board are those, right? And, and you know, that, that process is there. As much as I would love for that to be over with, I really would. You guys know this from me. I'd love to have it over. Now is the time to be vision. Now is the time to say we're going to get together with our neighbors to say how do we build internally our own trust as we go forward because that's going to end someday. And if you're doing the work now, and you're doing the leg work now, just like they're doing the highlights, the supervisor said, Rick said, this is going to take time. It's a cultural change. That cultural change of finances and legality with the tab eventually is going to run its course. But for the work that you're doing for building the type of trust that a community like Troy has, so that as decisions are made going forward, because you still have inspectors in the field. I mean, I know Wade Trim is your, is your, is your, is your group. I know they're good people. And it's not a bad firm. They're good people. And they would, I'm sure, welcome the opportunity to have a dialogue with your level in Pontiac, to have an understanding of, yeah, when we're out there in the field, this is the expectation of the people that are committing themselves to the betterment of the city. Now, that lecture applies to all y'all. It does. It really does. 
apply to all of you because the inspectors need to have that. You know, when I walked into Orion and Tim will attest to this, there wasn't a dialogue between the supervisor's office and this guy. I know there wasn't. There couldn't have been. It was too fractured. It just was. I mean, it's just, they're doing their job, but it was just too fractured. And so it does take time to, to, to build that trust up. Um, so it's about 7.30. Um, we're going to run through some clicker questions and things a little bit here. Uh, or go, go one more slide. Matt. One more slide? All right. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I think you probably have discussed these. Well, but now they know the answers. All right, here we go. The small credit, so I'll read them. Has the one stop rate program impacted the way that the supervisor, township board, planning commission, and staff interact with each other? So, has <laughs> learning from this program? has any words that we've said, this is a little self-aggrandizing here, but that's okay, <laughs> okay. Let's put it this way. In the last year, as the economy's improved, and all of you have made a new commitment to being ready, to being open for the opportunities, have things changed in your community and the stuff we're talking about tonight, the dialogue, the communication, the trust, those types of things, right? I would say absolutely. Uh, has made a, a major change. I would say that our board, and again, the supervisor and our board, uh, they haven't been able to come to these sessions because our board meetings were on these, at these meeting nights, but uh, the, the staff members that did come uh, imparted the information on me. I did watch all of the uh, sessions. I can't verify that the rest of the board members did, but or the rest of the planning commissioners. But my intent is to go forward to have them view them. Um, because I think it's important to pull all the pieces together, but one of the things that came across my desk today was a memo. Um, the other, yesterday I asked for some answers to how we can make something happen that had basically a no up front. I don't want to hear the no, I want to hear the yeses. Let's prove all the yeses first. Write me a statement that says we can prove all these things out, or we can't. But in, Give it to me in writing to show me how we can make something work. Ironically, as part of the memo, were the words, in the spirit of One Stop Ready. Hmm. At first I could take it as kind of, well, was that snarky or was that? Uh, <laughs> and the reality is, if you think about it, it's in there. It's in somebody's head. And it's in our, an individual employee's head, in the spirit of One Stop Ready. And our building has really been working very hard to keep that spirit and to go forward. Now the next step is you build the spirit. We also have been making it very clear to the public. I've been doing that specifically, but our building officials, uh, the people that greet people at the counter, inform them that we're working on this One Stop Ready program. Just the mention of that has, and I think I can get reinforcement from our our building department, our planning and zoning staff, has changed the way that people come into our office and address it from the counter side. In other words, the agitation, aggravation that most people would expect to you know, come in and then hope they receive it back so they can have that interaction, it's not there anymore. Oh, once in a while, but I mean, sometimes Some they- Some of that perceived kind of animus that happens in the process. So, you know, all of you have been involved with the process. There's always some type of animus at the counter at the building department, right? There always seems to be, doesn't there? You're saying that's easy because a absolutely. staff is starting to at least have the understanding of, no, we're more customer service based. Remember the very first day we said this program's about customer service? And you're seeing that in the public now, too. Yeah, and this, this staff looks daily at a the image of those signed signatures. Yeah. Right across from the counter. So when that, and I don't know if it's subliminal. I hope it is. Um, when they're standing there looking at the people, you, you're saying all the right stuff. You know, so it's it's the kind of thing that first you've got to get the perception, as, and you have the word perception, but you have to get the perception across to the broader community as well as to the in-house. We're working on this as we go along, and I think part of it is is it's hard to describe the One Stop Ready program to people who haven't participated within the building, so that's another step on my part to take this now to my team 
and say we all need to participate. So that that's where this is going to go. I'm really happy that we have a, a we have in-house officials that are here uh, tonight because that have been able to make it and they've all been saying we wish we could get there. But so and I'm happy to be here tonight too. So thanks. And and for any community, we've been back to Wixom and some others. Dan and I are more than willing to go to any community at any time to say, you know, we had a bunch of people who couldn't make it. Can you go give, like, the whole thing in one night over a couple hours? We're more than happy to do that in any community to, re to refresh it all. So we, we just thought. So um, a lot of the stuff we have talked about. So let me rephrase it a little bit. The so question number two, is it cost the township or any community to look at how aligned the priorities of elected and appointed officials are? So, you know, we've talked a lot about that today. Have you done that exercise? Have you, have you thought either in your head or you've had a dialogue at your board or your commission level to say, man, how are, you know, how, are we aligned with what we're trying to do here from a, just from a philosophical standpoint? <coughs> have any of the communities really engaged in that? I know it's hard to find. So it's kind of awesome. Just in the, in the, the top, the top side. Hey, Matt, just, just a point. You can do that, but you can't do it just, just one time. I've been on the Troy City Council for nine years now, and I've seen the okay, I've seen the really ugly, and now it's fantastic, as Ellen was saying. But we have an election coming up next November. Five seats out of seven are open. So, and I won't be there. So what I'm suggesting, and any community does, when you have an election and you get new people on your council, or you get new people appointed to your board, go through this refresher. They need this. Don't assume that they come in knowing this, because it's taken me nine years and I still have a lot to learn. Okay, but every time you change your city council or your, your township board, it's an opportunity for you and whoever else can come to help educate them and bring them to this level. Okay, and the encouragement to Pontiac is Troy hasn't always been on top. In this nine years, I've seen some really divisive councils. And when your council doesn't come together and everything is a 4-3 vote, that sends a ripple effect throughout the whole organization. So you need a, a strong city manager that can sort of mend that and bring everybody together and build collaborative efforts. But the council really needs to work as one. But don't always agree, but you agree the big picture. This is what we're trying to accomplish here. Agree the, agree the plan, the master plan, and all those things in the zone. But educate, educate your elected officials because sometimes they get elected because they're very popular, but they know nothing about planning. They know nothing about building. And I'm a good example of that. Yeah. Knowing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully I've learned a lot. Oh, that's good. So he brings up an interesting point. When he says constant 4-3 votes can be derisive, they can be damaging to your communities. Everybody. Oh, yeah. Agree with that mm -hmm. from a sure. base principle. Yeah. What if every 4 3 vote is, is engaged with positive dialogue and the 4 3 is always different? That's good. That's different. You understand know what, what I mean? That's, That's good. That's different. Yep. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's better. Because you get in communities. Who's ever seen a community or been in a community or presented a community where? Same four people vote together and the same three people vote together. It doesn't matter what the hell No matter what. You know you're no a dead community if, if you got four people all voting on the same thing and you know two of them hate it, then you're in trouble. So, yeah, so it's, it's, it's very interesting. Very, very good stuff. So we'll run, we'll run through a few, few more of these questions here. Um, we talked about asking the applicant, uh, we talked about the three-hour process. I think we can do that with the network, right? Um, ah, that's a good one. That's Who is the township has the authority no, to bring the necessary staff and consultants to the table? Where is plan? How does this work logistically? So I'm going to change it up. I don't mean pre-act. I mean bring to the table, like Rick was saying about, we're going to solve the problem. Who has authority, when we say the township city to me, to bring the necessary staff to the table? So if there is an issue, there's something that's broken down, say it's in not in the planning process, because economic development is more than just going to the planning commission. It's about getting stuff built. It's getting stuff repaired. It's uh, empowering people to invest. It's about so say it breaks down that that um, one of the inspectors has gone out and has tagged a construction project right in the middle of the construction project, 
and there's like 14 issues, which happens. I don't like it, but it happens, right? Who in the community is empowered to solve that problem? So, right, and why, like, who solves that problem? Who, who calls the people to the table? Figure well, out well, what went wrong. Ultimately, I would. I mean, it comes, it would come from my building department or planning department and say, we have an issue. And then I would say, well, get appropriate people in the table so we can go through those issues and try to resolve them. All right, so in your community, building official will come directly to you. Building and or planning. Or the right. planning will come and say, okay, we've, we've got, we've got. We've an got issue. an issue. Um, who haven't I picked up? Independence. How does this get solved? Who has the authority to solve, to start solving that issue? I'd say if the inspector is finding something in the field, they would contact the uh, Building director at that time. So, so in your community, it would be come up with a solution. so people have the authority to, to call the solution to the table is contained within the building department. Right, but someone's going to staff work or whatever. Instead of just like say writing a ticket, walk away. It's like what well, what can we do to solve the problem? <coughs> All right. So do you think that that is has always happened in your community, or is that more of now a new mentality with? with what the councilman said for Troy. You've had a changeover in your mentality past, and you're elected, so. Actually, a, a few years back, uh, our inspectors got in trouble for trying to do that. As opposed to, they were, they were being told by them, write the ticket, walk away, let them fix it or go to court or whatever. Like, so, yeah. Does everybody hear that? So, a few years ago, the independents, the inspectors were being told, don't bring that nonsense to me. Your job is to write tickets and go write tickets. I don't want to hear about that. Solve that went through the process, I'm assuming. Okay. Now it's changed. <clears throat> so now, would you say from an alignment standpoint that it's better aligned that the expectation of the management of the community, the management of the departments, and the people functionally doing the inspection of the work is better aligned so that they now feel <coughs> empowered to come and say, I had to tag this, but I have a solution? Well, I think that's what we're working on, trying to make sure we, we implement the procedures to make that happen. So I'm not saying it happens every time. Not every time, but get, getting to that <coughs> point, that's right. the goal, right? Well, I guess we're trying to change our procedures or work instructions to make that so everybody knows that's what you're supposed to do. Not just stop working, I guess. Just not stop working. So did everybody follow what I just said? So the management trusts the department heads that are running the staff who have empowered the staff when they hit a problem to come up the food chain and say, I had to do this because the law makes me tag this, but I have a solution. So raise your hand if you're an elected official. Is that your expectation in your community, that that process would happen? Yep. Yes. All right. Now put your hand back up if you are 100% confident that's what happens in your community. 100%. All right. So you guys are being honest because there has to be, as Councilman said, there has to be trust in, in, in the system going forward, right? But isn't that the ideal world that we want? We want people to enforce the law. We want them to be diligent. We want them to be aware of what's going on, but we want them to be empowered solution makers for your community. Is there any other way to get them to do that than to have trust that everybody is communicating and the community is moving from a dialogue and trust factor? Is there any other way to accomplish that, to have a building official go out of their way to create a solution for something? Tim, if you work in a completely dysfunctional environment, do you feel empowered to make solutions to fix things, or you just kind of here to do my job? You can be honest. I've always been able to to resolve most of it myself when there is issues. I know me and you had a few that we had to go to you to say, "Look, this is what needs to be done." I mean, I've never worked in a dysfunctional. Completely dysfunctional Just community. Just because your boss is sitting next to you. Doesn't mean <laughs> He's my new boss. So. <laughs> no, but the point of it is, is, is if your expectation is, and we have so many communities come to us and say, you know, you've got 200 economic development projects right now. How come there's not 46 of them in that community? You know, a lot of it is, is where these projects start to land in their own accord. And when they get to us, they already have a sense of where they want to be. So where is your first line of, of attraction? Where is your first line of customer service representation? Is it, did, they, did they come across the project and they're talking to your building inspector in the field 
and they want to get some information, and does that, is that person empowered to be able to say, yeah, you know what, we can do this, we can get this done for you, or is that person, man, I, above my pay grade, I can't say. Those are the decisions that you have to make as a community from when it comes to management structure. Because the communities that empower those people, like Pete Auger did when he was city manager at Auburn Hills, he expected, when they went out and they found some, he always uses something where you know, somebody was doing pet grooming at a, in their house or something like that, mm -hmm. so they, you know, they can't do that, running a business out of their house. And so before it even got to his desk, they had already went and shown the person a place in a little downtown area and called the landlord and said, listen, we can get you in this building instead, so you know, let's get you some, it was that empowered, solution making difference. If the inspector just came out and cites, and then the person gets all angry, and now they're calling their friend who calls the council person, and then finally six weeks later gets the city manager, what gets accomplished? That person talking completely negative about your community for those six weeks. But if your whole staff is structured so that even your inspector level feels empowered to say, I'm an advocate for this community, and they come up with a solution, the six weeks it takes to do the solution, now they're talking about your community in a positive way. Because they tell all their neighbors, man, this nice man came along and yeah, I got caught doing this, but he's got a solution for me. And the whole demeanor, from back to the developer perspective, is yeah, that's a community I want to do business in. And it just is, so it's cool. Um, authority, empower staff, to that's what we just talked about, perfect. How do you ensure that the boards, commissions, and the public receive proactive and clear communication about development projects? We talked about that a little bit. So now that we, 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 we have an idea, how do you ensure that the right information is going out? It goes back to my question an hour ago where I said, if, you don't, if you're not in the meeting, how do you know? Does everybody have a better understanding of the dialogue that it takes to know that? Right, that's good. What other approaches the management structure uses to be more developed? All right, let's conclude my part of this. And I'm gonna turn it over to Dan to run the rest of the meeting. What's the, the number one thing that you do to make sure that you know what's going on in the process in your community. I word that okay? What's the number one thing you do individually, not your community, what do you do individually? To make sure you know what the heck is going on when it comes to all this stuff that I quiz my good friend Don Walker. I didn't mean to do that, Don, you know. But how do you know? What's, what do you do to know that you're informed? What do you do to know you're informed? Stay engaged. Stay engaged. Yeah, I mean, I'm on planning commission, so in the end, once a month or so, it's, you know, I don't, I need to do, I need to do a better job <coughs> myself personally, but it would be benefit to everybody if I went in and talked to the building the director, went in and engaged, you know, talked to Ron and other board members and. So when you say stay engaged, you mean you come ready to do the work, you review the packets, you've read everything, you're engaged, you, you know what's going on, or do you mean engaged that well, I pick up some meetings, I come in, I talk, or? What I, what I meant by that is what I, what I can, I'm looking at this process, what I can do better beyond just, okay, I get the packet, I reviewed review the packet, I'm not opening it up that night. That, for me, is, goes without saying. But that is what's expected, expected of me to be prepared for my meetings. But beyond that, stay engaged, Go in and, and visit with the building director, um, even you know between meetings. Find okay, what's going on? What what pre-app meetings do you have coming in? What projects are coming? That's something that I'm taking from this that I can do more of. So I haven't picked on the back table yet. So somebody back there, how do you how do you know that this communication's happening? How do you stay engaged? As well? how, how do you make sure that you can trust that the information you've been given is the right stuff? How, how do you do that? Somebody. How do you do that? You can just be sure that um, your staff, if any problems are going on, they bring it to your attention right away so you are aware of the problems that are going out there and then the others, the regular inspections that are just passing and are going through uh, will work themselves out. But if you have your building official come to you and explain to you, here's the problem and then you're aware of it and then you can work with the developer and the building official to mediate what the issue is. So it sounds like it's getting back to that trust work. The work's getting done. You have to build a large, large modicum that the consultants and the staff are doing what they're supposed to do. It. We're sending a good, strong message. Who in the community is, has, has, in the last year, has hosted a meeting where 
you invited everybody in the process into one place. I don't mean like everybody like this, but like in your community, you say, okay, well, for these development processes, I know we <coughs> constantly deal with, uh, we bring a couple of key planning commissioners and I'm gonna build my building department and the inspectors are gonna come in and the planners come in. We're just gonna have an open talk about how are things going. Who's hosted the how are things going meeting in the last year? Yeah. What do you think would be the result of something? <coughs> Don, what would be the result of having a meeting like that here city? And we get angry? Frank's specific. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Would it be a positive to do that? I think so. Is anybody afraid to do that? You be honest. He was in there. He was in there. I don't know why you would be afraid to do that. Michael, what do you think about that? The last, couple, the last year, we've had uh, joint meetings with the Township Board, the Planning Commission, and the ZBA. Everybody has a dialogue. Everybody has a dialogue. Right? And he's going over uh, ordinances. And, you know, what, what we do better? Oh, every man. Every two years? Yeah. 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 Twice a year, you mean? Or? No, every two years. Oh, every two years? Yeah. Um, to have those type of dialogues. Who's had a meeting? If you're the, the top official in your community, when's the last time that you sat down with all of the inspectors in your community and just said, all right, what's going on out there? What are you seeing? What, what's happening? With the inspector. Yeah, full -time. <laughs> so, Every day. Even with the part timers that come in in the morning, which is Ray and Jim, I always greet them, got any issues, and then it's once again open communication. So that dialogue. So yeah. in that in that instance, supervisor, if one of the inspectors says, says yeah, I don't really, I don't really like what you're trying to tell us to do, so I'm just going to do it my way. Probably doesn't happen because they're scared of it, but, but, but that's probably the dialogue could go that way, right? But I think it could. What would be your response to that? Because there's communities like Pontiac. Well, they're going to walk in, they're going to tell Wade Trim what to do. Here, Wade Trim answers to the, the the city administrator slash emergency manager. I mean, it's just different. So I'm just opening up a dialogue for how do you deal with that? Or how would you do it? I really you know, talk to the individual that I know that has any issues. Um, I got a call the other day. Mm -hmm. So your, your inspector was never over to my house. And I said, are you sure? Because sometimes we have, for electrical inspections, we have uh, a time frame. We'll be there between 8 and 10. And I said, are you sure the inspector has not I waited here all day. So the inspector came in the following day and I asked him, I said, did you go to this home? And he goes, yes, I did. I said, well, the gentleman is telling me that he did. He says, well, I can tell you that there is a red Toro lawnmower in his backyard that was covered in snow. And he actually got on the phone with the resident and said, do you have a red Toro lawnmower in your backyard covered in snow? I was, yeah, how'd you know? Because it was there. It's his backyard. Communication, right? Communication is the key. So I'm going to quit talking. Dan's going to run you through some perceptive questions with the clickers. It'll be interesting to see if, I know he's going to ask, would your answer have been different prior to this, you know, hour plus dialogue about structure and, and, and communication and, and trust? Um, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for all of you, um, I have a wife out of town and grandparents in good health, and I've got three kids in three different places that I have to go pick up. So um, I'm going to be a parent for, for a little bit, and Danny's going to take the rest of the I will conclude this for me personally by saying, one, I want to thank all of you for the commitment that you made in these four sessions. I hope that you found value in the dialogue of them. I appreciate this, but it's, that you said that the thinking is a little different. Even if the actions are, are the follow the culture, the thinking is, is good. We can't thank you enough because, you know, to do something like this and have over 100 people every time is very rewarding. It tells us that the topic is good, that people are interested in bettering their community, they're interested in bettering their community. And as Dan wraps up tonight, um, uh, he may or may not uh, go through, it is important, the most important thing is not coming to listen to you talk and blather on. The most important thing is implementing the idea of having this trust, having this dialogue, having an understanding that when somebody walks in the door, that the expectation of everybody in your community 
is that as a customer that's going to get what they need, information, service, positive attitude, a reflection of what your community wants to be. So the hard work of One Stop Ready is our first seven communities found in the first year. That's why Dan and I had to go back a couple times. The hard work comes afterwards because it's quite easy to get into a routine and say, yeah, I went through that. It was really cool. They had great information. It was, it was <coughs> And we need to get out of life. The key part is to be implementing this. Well, too bad for you, you signed up for the program, which means we're not going to let you just go into the dark uh, of night and, uh, and, and, and prattle on. We will be in amongst you in a very, very positive way to say, how's it going? We need to be doing these different things. There's a couple of new initiatives that we're going to start after the first of the year where I'm going to be calling in the leadership of the communities so that good supervisors can continue to have a dialogue amongst you, city managers and others. As you see those, please participate with the same enthusiasm that you've come to these academies. They're intended for your benefit. It's intended to have this type of dialogue. It's intended for you to hear what your neighbor's doing and to say, man, I could be as good as Troy. We can do that. You know, and have to pick up the phone, have them come visit you, those types of things. And so, Dan, the floor is yours. Thanks. and, and um, Merry Christmas. Thank you. Can we give this guy a hand? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's the end of oh. <laughs> I'm a North Carolina guy. So, no. yeah, you can boo that too. <laughs> um, we've got some uh, we've got some quicker things to work on here. Um, the comment that Matt made about we're being able and interested to come back out to any of your groups. Uh, he mentioned the WIG some, and um, it was the Joint Planning Commission, ZBA, uh, City Council, and all staff. And three of us were out. Just to kind of go through the whole thing again in 45 minutes at a high level. And um, I hope they then had another meeting, or maybe it was after we left, to have a really good discussion trying to pull that together. But, I mean, the first thing tonight, communication and trust. Um, our staff has had uh, the pleasure to sit in on some of Auburn Hill's pre-application meetings. And it's amazing the, 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 how they work, the entire team, and that's the leadership, that's the management saying we're all in, um, disagreement, uh, solutions. Uh, developers walk away. They know where what they need to do. Sometimes they walk away. Not going to work here. Time is money. So um, we've been really impressed with with that leadership, that <coughs> management, and I almost think that when it gets to the council and the planning committee, I mean, it has been intensely vetted, and they understand that and they trust that. Um, but you have to have trust as folks in Troy were saying. Um, and a great time, great time for you to be working on this because of the economy, which is really pretty good. Perfect, no? Still could be a lot better, yeah. But we're seeing stuff. I see it every day, drive around the county, and it's unbelievable. Uh, so it's a great time to try to, as Matt said, implement. So we've got, uh, We've got some questions here, and has everybody got their clicker? Yeah. Grab a clicker. Boy, this is like after the answers, after we've already talked about it. Why did we do it at the end? <laughs> All right. Let's just go. I think this is going to be close to 100%. Maybe not. Does your community hold the pre-application meetings? So, uh, Ryan, we're on. <clears throat> How many did we give out? How many little clickers? There's the number in the corner there, so it'll be right around 60. <clears throat> no, I just press it. <laughs> Bet your life, no way, I have no idea. I did one of these at SoundCloud this morning, and it was based on the skills gap, and it was really interesting to see uh, some convergence and then a lot of difference of opinion. All right, what do we have? Just take a second sometimes. Is that Groucho Marx? Yep. Yes. I'm too young to know. Yeah, I wish I were. Number one, bet your life. 
two? No way. Oh. Where's the no way? Is no way going to be maybe in the future? Somebody's pulling my leg. <laughs> and we have a few I have no idea. Uh, second question. Have you ever participated in a pre-application meeting? By the way, we're, we're working on uh, this at the county level too with our team from planning and economic development, water resource commissioner, health department, uh, road commission of um, having those one-stop ready contacts and the ability to pull them together for things that we're working on or maybe you're working on and you need that team assembled. Uh, so we're trying to make the same kind of change and break down the barriers. There's no way I'm doing it. Brett, is that your artwork? Number two? Well, that's a, an old picture of Matt from high school. <laughs> <laughs> and we got 55% and some things to work on there. Uh, how do you make potential investors aware they can have pre application meetings? One person, <laughs> there's your customer <laughs> service. Uh, two, the web page. Three, documents, hard copy. Four, other stuff. All the above or other. I guess the interesting, does anybody track that? In terms of numbers. Track the in-person versus the web page. You know, the free strips of paper, they still work pretty good. I've got a daughter in college, and it's amazing in the lobby. The stuff that's sitting out there. <clears throat> other stuff. Somebody want to tell me what they mean by other stuff? All of it? All of it. Is there anything else in terms of the customer, the web, materials? Is there anybody um, anybody using social media? And the last question, I think the last, what is the cost uh, to the applicant of a pre-application meeting? Free? A small fee? Small fortune, small fortune. <laughs> Probably should have been, I don't know, fourth. And this would include, uh, you know, the consultants that are brought in. Hopefully, the, if they're planning or engineering or legal, hopefully they're, they're not charging. Or providing uh, their time as part of the process. Bree, oh heck, we got to market this, <laughs> which is uh, part of our obligation is to begin to market this, uh, to market the fact that you all have gone through this. Uh, but free, that's that's terrific. Uh, a small fortune. Who said a small fortune? <laughs> Oak Park? No. No? Sorry. <laughs> okay. They've done a lot of work. I was joking. Well, I said it, but I realized that the consultants come in because it's part of the regular time. That they correspond with planning meetings. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it, was a separate, it wasn't a separate fee. So the key would be to get them to provide it. I mean, if you have one day a week pre-application, <sighs> then you can probably get it for free. If it's every day, it's not going to happen. Right? Does your ordinance allow some actions to be handled by administrative approval? Yes? No? And I have no idea. We talked a lot about this tonight. This was, this was right on. I liken the I liken the process uh, a 
lot, it's team. It's almost uh, like a marriage, we're a team, and it's all based on communication and trust. And if that's not there, you know, how can you handle, how can you count on your administrative approval? Number one, yes. And somebody said no again. Is that you, Sharon? No. <laughs> yeah. Is that the last? It's oh. the last one. Is your staff empowered to make decisions? <laughs> and even Pontiac does have staff. They have good staff. We have worked with staff on a number of economic golf projects and they're really good. <laughs> What's your guess? One hundred percent on number one. Pretty good. You know, this would be a good one to do maybe in the first session, and then come back. Um, Sort of before and after. <clears throat> That's it. I too want to thank you very much for your time and attention. Um, we'll be following up on some of these best practices with our liaison. We're available anytime to come out and talk. Are there any questions? Any, any other questions or thoughts? I don't know. Get them all out. Um, but we'll be following up with the liaison, and we're uh, we're interested in any of your thoughts as to how we can make this better. It's a great suggestion on the changing of city council. Um, I mean, I've been with the county 28 years, and I'm still learning. Always learning. Uh, there's 61 communities, and it's always dynamic. And, and so maybe putting something together for elected officials, a guidebook or maybe video snippets or something. Yeah. To turn over there as well. All right, with that, I thank you very much. We will see you again. Thanks everyone for coming. Have a good evening.